This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So it's uh, my pleasure as always to uh, introduce Dr. Chris Owens, one of the uh, co-chairs of this uh, program, to uh, talk to us a bit about patient level risk factors in the CLI. Thank you, Warren. I think um, during this session we're going to try to break it, break it down from you know, from the sort of the, the global, uh, with the, from the patient level factors to the limb, to the, to the, and, and then finally down to the foot. So we'll, we'll take a 10,000 foot view and we'll go down to a 100 foot view and then we'll go down right down into the, uh, the one foot view. Um, I was just talking to some uh, folks at the, uh, d during the break and uh, uh, the top five papers that are most cited in vascular surgery uh, was published in a paper that, uh, uh, that came out of the 50 most influential papers in vascular surgery. All five of the top five were papers on carotids and how we deal with carotid disease, asymptomatic and symptomatic, and how we choose which ones to operate. So just as a little tidbit there. Uh, so I'm gonna get on with, uh, with the, the task at hand and I'm charged to tell you or convince you that, that it's not critical limb ischemia, it should be called critical patient ischemia and I'll try to show you why. Um, I'm a paid to talk about peripheral interventions by Bard and Medtronic as my disclosures. Uh, so the natural history of the critical limb ischemia patient is, is a model of competing risks. Which is going to happen first? Are they going to die or is the limb going to be amputated? These are the major adverse outcomes that can affect this population. They're pretty much equal in terms of mortality and amputation here of one year for the untreated CLI patients. Now this is a rather old study, but I like it because it kind of emphasizes what I, what I wanted to point out to you is that really we have to be very careful for both of these things and they have equally uh, opportunities of happening. I practice in a veterans uh, hospital situation and uh, I like to look at veteran data. Uh, so this is a survival of 4,061 vets uh, undergoing either a, a, a fempopliteal bypass or a femtibial bypass and what happened to them. Now this is very, this is, this is a rather old data set because it was published in 2001. That means the data was collected in the 90s, uh, which is probably before uh, widespread adoption of statins. Nevertheless, it gives you some idea of what happens to 4,000 patients. And we don't have a lot of studies at 4,000 patients. One thing I wanted to point out, of these 4,000 patients, we have 3,642 of them produce 17,694 readmissions. That's astounding. That's an astounding number. 15, 1559 were admitted five times. Now, Dr. Gasper, have you seen, have you seen this? Dr. Gasper is a VA patient. He, he understands this happens, uh, and I'm sure it happens in your practice too. This is ex extremely expensive. 1,097 uh, additional bypass grafting procedures. So clearly, uh, bypass surgery, even before statins, uh, quite onerous on these patients in this patient population, quite a lot of healthcare risk. Uh, the re major amputation after femoral popliteal bypass, why that's higher than the, the anterior, the, the tibial bypass, it's unclear, but there's, I got some ideas that we'll go into a little bit later. Uh, what about functional status after low extremity revascularization of nursing home residents? If you're not functional prior to the surgery and you're admitted into a nursing home, you probably don't have a whole uh, uh, good chance of, of, uh, of long, long time life expectancy. Here we see that the non ambulatory patients that had procedures done, uh, low extremity revascularization, regardless of what the revascularization was, 50% were dead in one year. Uh, so how do, we, how do we work with this? You know, we have, we have competing risk of death and amputation. We have a very comorbid population. Um, there are risk scores. Uh, this is the second time this risk score has been pre uh, presented this, uh, this session or this morning. Um, this is a CLI risk score, which was, uh, which was uh, 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 
uh, developed off the uh, Prevent 3 database of 1,400 patients and then, and then validated again in the uh, Vascular Surgery Group in New England. It's one of the 25 or so papers out of the Vascular Surgery Group in New England. And, and look at the risk score. It's dialysis, it's tissue loss, it's age greater than 75, it's hematocrit greater than less than 30, and it's coronary artery disease. Well, this is fine and this is good for stratification, but there's, they're really not really modifiable. You can't do much about the age or if they're on dialysis. I mean, you get what you get, and uh, they, they can help stratify your risk in terms of what you should do, or maybe, but you really can't do anything more. In addition, I'd submit to you that it's pretty intuitive. Uh, you don't really need a risk score to, uh, to tell you that the dialysis patient that you're doing a bypass on or a tibial angioplasty is probably going to do worse than one without renal fun uh, dysfunction. So the risk prediction scores in, in, in patients with CLI I don't think are helpful clinically. I don't think they're used a whole lot uh, by any of us clinically, but uh, I think they confirm what we already know. I think they have modest discriminatory ability. I don't think they're generalizable because they were developed and validated in a subset of patients that were already undergoing already pre-selected to undergo intervention. What is the full de denominator? We really don't know that information, and they're developed on patients that were selected for surgery already. We need an all-comer trial that's probably based at the level of the primary care physician or entry into the healthcare system to figure out what we're really doing and where it's going. Uh, we're, we're really dealing with a subset of uh, patients that are already uh, uh, coming through with a lot of pre-biases. So this is a question, uh, an audience response question. It's regarding the biochemistry. So I'm going to take away from what I just told you and move on to a little bit different uh, uh, area that I think may have an opportunity to build upon that. So regarding the biochemistry of the CLI patient, which is false. And so I have two sort of opposite question, uh, uh, choice B and choice D are opposite. So for test taking uh, strategy, I would choose one of those. And the surgeons in the audience will probably know this because it's very intuitive. Uh, we've been dealing with, uh, with this kind of thing for a long time. And so what do we got here? We got choice C, have low total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol. We have choice D, albumin is the strongest risk predictor, and choice B, CRP is the strongest risk predictor. So which is false? Well, to be honest with you, Low, album, low total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol is very common in a CLI patient. And I'll show you coming up here. It'll be interesting to you. Let's talk about cachexia for a second. What is cachexia? We've heard about it. We, we know in cancer patients, it's a wasting disease. CHF patients, uh, a rheumatoid cachexia. It's, it's based on a cytokinemia and the effect that cytokines have on the, on the, on the entire body, on multiple organs, on the, on the neuroendocrine system. Um, on the uh, vascular system, uh, basically your, your entire metabolism. It's a wasting disease. You do waste protein. And I would submit to you again that the cytokinemia that is associated with CLI is the same or worse than the cytokinemia associated with these diseases that are already under cachexia. What I'm saying is there's a sort of a cachexia of CLI. Uh, Looking here just at two specific cytokines, and, and, and I'm not going to talk too much about cytokines, but IL-6 and, and tumor necrosis factor alpha receptor 2. These are very, uh, these are commonly measured research studies or research uh, uh, biomarkers. And if you look at, this is from our data, it's not published, but if you look at interleukin-6, it's higher than the patients who have CHF stage 4 heart failure. And if you look at TNF-alpha receptor 2, which is a very common marker for the, for the CHF uh, uh, heart failure stratification, it's higher in, in PAD with CLI. So that PAD means CLI here. So the, the cachexia that I would presume comes from these cytokines of a CLI patient, of the, of the six CLI patients that you've taken care of, is probably very similar to what uh, you might get in a, a, an end-stage heart failure patient or a... Uh, or a, or a rheumatoid factor patient. Now, you could say, well, uh, Chris, these are just uh, wounds that are, are leaking these things. I want to make sure that, that we, we selected these patients so that they did not have infections of the foot. They, we, we would allow small, uh, non-infected ulcers, but uh, uh, and as demonstrated here, uh, the white blood cell count is actually uh, 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 between the CLI patients and the, uh, and the uh, claudication patients, there's no difference. Uh, but CLI has lower albumin. Albumin is the strongest risk predictor of anything we measure. If you look at albumin and want to, and, want to, and this was proven in the VA in the 1990s, I think, Joe Rapp would know, uh, 80s, uh, 
this is, a, <clears throat> this is the strongest risk, risk predictor that we have. CRP is a good one, but it's not as strong as albumin. That was the correct answer. EGFR is lower, but it's not that much lower than uh, claudication patients. And again, uh, uh, hemoglobin is a little bit lower too. Well, what about cholesterol? What about total cholesterol? Well, CLI patients have lower total cholesterol. They have very low LDLs and HDLs. Why is that? Well, these cholesterol, these, these lip lipoproteins are carried by apolipoproteins, which are the proteins that basically carry the, the rafts that carry them through the bloodstream. This could be due to statins, but I'd also submit to you that it's not. When we look at statins, the patients who are not on statins weren't on statins probably because they didn't have high cholesterol in the first place. This, was, uh, th this data was collected in the uh, mid-2000s, but, but since the adoption of statins. Uh, you can see by the standard deviations that these, these groups are pretty similar, but still, again, there's, more, uh, there's, uh, there's less cholesterol, LDL, and HDL in the critical limb ischemia patient probably because of the high cytokines and the de decreased production of apolipoproteins proteins and albumin, et cetera. When you look at the inflammation sort of whole pr pr profile and you look at, and you stage by these biomarkers, inflammatory cytokines, they're higher in CLI than in claudication. They're very high in fact. Uh, CRP, MCP1, and, and the tumor necrosis factor receptor that we just talked about. And if you look at them in terms of survival, these are all univariate analysis. Patients with lower cholesterol do worse in CLI. Patients with lower albumin do worse in CLI. Higher inflammation, they do worse. It's paradoxical in a way. Cholesterol has a J-shaped mort uh, mortality curve. If you wanna look at prediction, C statistic. The C statistic basically tells us if I, flip, if, if I have two patients, how likely uh, one with a disease, one without a disease, how likely am I to know which one it is? And the, and, the, and the statistic here for the clinical model would be I'm 70% likely, 0 0.7072. Don't worry about this, we're not gonna talk about it, but I have a 70% chance of differentiating whether dead or alive at one year if I just use a clinical risk factor model of age, diabetes, coronary disease, and whether they have critical limb ischemia or not. But if I start adding in a glomerular filtration rate, albumin, I can get that up to 80, uh, 80, 82%. Um, we're not going to talk about IDI either. If we just look at prediction in, in another graphical way, if you're, if you're more a visual uh, uh, learner, you can see the ROC, which is a very, uh, the area under the ROC curve, these receiver operating characteristic curves, it's very similar to the C statistic. And this is just with age, diabetes, CAD, and CLI. You can't modify any of these things. You potentially could modify uh, the level of inf inflammation or, or protein. Uh, and again, we're getting up into the 80s when we add these other biochemical factors. Another way of looking at it is, remember, the renal function is not that impaired, less than 60. You, these are a dime a dozen, you, uh, EGFR of 55 or 56. Albumin, I'm not talking about a, a malnutrition to the level of less than uh, 3.0, just less than 3.5, or inflammation, uh, greater, than, greater, greater than five milligrams per liter. If you are in the unlucky person to be in this convergence of these circles here, this 21 patients, you're, 10 t you're nearly 10 times as likely to die uh, following a procedure uh, within a year. So I wanna talk about one potential way of mitigating some of this uh, stuff, and this is uh, some work that we've been doing, uh, whereby we're trying an anti-inflammatory medication at the level of the blood vessel when we're treating it. We know that angioplasty causes an inflammatory response. We think that if we can knock down the inflammatory spots, we'll subsequently decrease entomoperplasia and resinosis. This is the outside of the blood vessel. This is the inside of the blood vessel. This is all the stuff that happens after, after uh, uh, balloon angioplasty. We use a, a catheter that, uh, uh, from Mercator Med Systems. It's a, a microinfusion catheter. It has two ports, one for the balloon that causes a backwards pressure that pushes the needle up to the blood vessel. And then, of course, one, uh, uh, one the uh, port that actually in injects uh, a uh, dilute contrast of whatever drug you want to try and, con and, uh, and uh, contrast so that you can see it visually on fluoroscopy. And this is what it looks like when you show fluoroscopy. This is not an angiogram over here on the, on the uh, right side. This is actually just the dexamethasone with the, with the adventitial infusion across the whole blood vessel. And then, of course, this is the angiogram right here. These are the trials that are running right now, uh, the DANCE trial. 
Uh, we just got noticed that we have 204 patients enrolled, so just a year. So it's, it's enrolling very fast, which I think is, a, is a, some testimony to the, uh, to the buy-in of, uh, of the PIs that, we've, uh, that we have. Uh, a third of them are going to get biomarkers data. And uh, I can show you just a little bit of biomarker data today, which, which I think is pretty cool. There's also a registry, and particularly uh, for this talk, uh, there's this uh, trial called Limbo that's going to be coming out soon. It's going to be run both in Leipzig and also in the United States two arms, a PTA arm, and a uh, atherectomy arm. And so this is going to begin about Q2 2015. It's going to be 120 patients with PTA and 120 patients with, AI, uh, with uh, atherectomy. Now, this is a little bit of a peek at our interim data. This is a Schillinger paper that was published in the, uh, a few years ago, which basically showed the peri-inflammatory response to an intervention is related to subsequent restenosis down the road. And if you have a pretty high uh, increase in your inflammatory response, you have higher chance of having a restenosis. Whereas in patients who had a lower increase after the, after the intervention, they had a lower chance of intervention. We did a tiny little pilot study at the, at the VA, and we showed that you know we put some dexamethasone in the blood vessel. It was a very heterogeneous group of patients. It was pure safety and feasibility but we thought we had a decent little signal here. So we went ahead and in 18 patients with PTA and 27 patients with, uh, with, with actorectomy, we have actually some data showing that the post-inflammatory response is not that high. I don't know what it means. It's a surrogate, imp it's a surrogate marker, but at least it's a, it's, it, it says that we're maybe doing what we intend to do with the dexamethasone. It's interesting that the atherectomy appears to cause less injury than the balloon angioplasty. It's totally opposite of what I would have thought. It's not what my hypothesis would have been. You heard me yesterday talk about atherectomy. Um, but he, here we go, we have, this is real world data. It's not that much. So let me give you a conceptual framework of what you can do for inflammation, perhaps uh, in your own practice. Well, we're informed by you know, some of the larger trials you know, that, that green on the, on the left side is sort of the Paul Ricker area. That's your Jupiter trial, which is compared to resuvastatin uh, in patients who otherwise would not have received a statin. Uh, your CRIT study, which is a canicanamib, which is a monoclonal antibody to interleukin-1 beta uh, methotrexate. Uh, it's a very low dose, Q-weak methotrexate. Um, omega fatty acids. This is, uh, this is Marlene's square right here. She's, uh, she's doing the high dose uh, omegas. Uh, could try pulse steroids. Some evidence suggests pulse steroids. Very high dose vitamin D. Check the vitamin D levels in your patients. They're all low. I don't know what that means, whether it's a, a co-founder or whether it's actually causative. Um, I'm working sort of in this space, and uh, Dr. Conti is actually working on some very interesting resolvins and lipoxins that hopefully we'll be able to tell you about next year. And then there's all kinds of things that are coming up in, the, in that uh, we've talked about uh, uh, today with the, with the drug uh, or, or this, this, this session with the drug-coated uh, stents and balloons and things like that. So in conclusion, patients with CLI have two co primary competing risks. It's death and amputation that you've got to guard against. Critical limb ischemia patients, a critical, it should be critical patient ischemia. Uh, a subset of uh, have a, actually a vascular cachexia characterized by these high cytokines. Current risk model, models have had little benefit over intuition, but maybe important comparative risk evaluations creating observed over expected risk research, et cetera. Current risk models are not modifiable. Biochemical model may be more accurate. For example, I showed you an example with a C statistic of 0.82, and biochemical models may be modifiable. I want to thank you for your attention for the whole course. Make sure you fill out your evaluations. We need to see those. Um, anything I said that's, uh, that's true, I uh, attribute to uh, Mike Conti and Joe Rapp and Linda and, and these guys over here. Anything I said is probably not true is probably my own mistake. Uh, I have a whole new respect and appreciation for this man right here, uh, having, <laughs> having done my inaugural one here. Uh, Warren Gasper, I couldn't have, you know, he, uh, he helps me in my clinic. I couldn't have done this without him and Marlene and Sandy and everybody else. So thank you very much for all your attention. Um, happy to entertain any questions. All right. Well, uh, Chris, that was great. Um, but just so one question in terms of that new uh, biochemical risk model that you have, what do you do with the patient that's in the eye of that hurricane, the low albumin, poor GFR, high 
CRP patient? Well, I think Mike showed us some pretty compelling data that sometimes you don't have to do anything. If, if they don't have infection, they don't have, um, they don't have some kind of compelling reason, maybe just, uh, maybe just uh, uh, sit it out a little bit and, and, and wait. And th there's, there's pretty good limb salvage just doing that. I suspect those patients would be pretty disabled. I wouldn't do a bypass on them, though. Those are the patients who are going to have wound breakdown and a bunch of other problems. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you.